All right, so yeah, as, uh, as they said, I'm Jeff Disher, so I, uh, I'm going to be talking about caching in Java, specifically with EH Cache, some talks about how um, some things like JSR 107 support and EH Cache 3, way things like clustered caching work uh, with Terracotta server. Specifically, what I do there, I work on the Terracotta team at Software AG. Um, I work on, well, I'll get into this bit, but basically, some, for the most part, this uh, presentation is going to talk about that, try and keep it at an interesting level. Hopefully that goes over well. Some of the slides for this are pulled from something uh, one of my coworkers in Montreal, Anthony Dehani, did at a DevOps talk not too long ago, one of the ones in Europe. So anyway, just kind of quick background to what I'm doing. Yeah, I've been working for, for this company, for Terracotta, since um, April 2015, so about two years now. Um, there I've been working on the Terracotta 5 server platform. So what this means is while EH Cache is uh, kind of the, the product that sits on top of everything, uh, that has both a standalone and a clustered version, so which backends off what we build on the server platform. So that consists of middleware APIs, client server messaging, and that kind of thing, and also server server messaging, election management, other sort of clustery bits. <clears throat> so some things I wanted to go over in this talk. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the caching basics, some ways, you know, some interesting relative terms and regarding performance, stuff like that, why it's something worth keeping an eye on, and thinking about caching methodologies, how this matters in terms of choices of how to use things like EH Cache, which give you more direct control over what you're doing, versus things that may kind of automatically try and build in some sort of caching support through annotations or some sort of other kind of magical config, and some concerns that may come up regarding that that you need to be aware of. Uh, JSR 107. Uh, kind of its, its background and how that plays into the interaction with EH Cache and Terracotta. Uh, so then more talk about EH Cache, EH Cache 3 specifically. Um, some details about other aspects of EH Cache design, like uh, caching tiers. Uh, cluster caches, because given the part of the project I work on, it's the part that I have the deepest understanding of. And also I'm going to do a quick demo of something which is a really simple, hello world-ish sort of uh, demo, but also using things like high availability clustered caching, just you know, to overcomplicate things. So while caching in general has a pretty broad definition, for the purposes that, we're gonna, that we use within sort of the EH Cache 3 world, it comes down to this statement, with it being some map, just key value mapping, with capacity control for your eviction and freshness control for expiry. Um, and th these are things that then get configured within how you're using EH Cache. Um, so other sort of basics, just relative terms of what matters within, and why it's important is that sure, 150 milliseconds sounds like nothing, but compared to some other things you could be doing, that's nine years that you're spending waiting for data. So any time that you can move kind of further to the top of this list by in introducing the cache into the right place, it's worth doing. So looking at terms I'm going to be using, which are probably familiar to most people, but um, some, you know, I just want to make sure it's all covered. Uh, common terms get used. A hit is when interacting with a cache. That's when you ask the cache for data, and it actually gives you that data. A miss is the times when it doesn't. Uh, cold cache is a fully empty cache, whereas a hot cache is a full one. This is why you often hear terms like in performance measurement, Oh, we're going to do the warm-up run before their measurement run, things like that. Make sure that because its cache is all the way down in every aspect of the stack, so you want to make sure that they're at least representative of a running state. System of record. Uh, this is the authoritative data in the system. So you may have a cache that's sitting on top of this, but your system of record is going to be whatever the definition of actual data truth is in the system. So this might be SQL database, no SQL store, random data files, something like that. Just abstractly, it's just the system of record. So when looking at this, what to measure when trying to decide when to, whether a cache is doing what you want or how to actually look at optimizing the benefit it's giving you is gonna be things like, all right, your cache usage, how fully populated is this? 
your hit ratio. So your hits over total access attempts. Um, if that's too low, you know, is your cache too small and you're just rolling over the data and evicting it too quickly? Or are you caching the wrong thing, something that doesn't actually get reused? And a hit rate, which is going to have more to do with what your application domain is actually trying to do, how much they expect to actually be hitting the cache and what that should actually look like. So caching methodologies, sort of the, an important breaking off point for, for how some of these things end up mattering. First of all, with no caching, every algorithm should still be correct. You should not be relying on a cache for correctness. Um, sometimes we've seen that happen and it can be problematic because if something gets evicted, that's okay within a cache. But if your application relies on that being in a certain state for its correctness, you're gonna have a bad time. So that's the basic application and system of record. You load something and it comes back. So everything should always work with that kind of setup. Cache aside, now this is where the cache is populated from the application. This is typically what you're going to see in some of these automatically make my application cacheable with some annotations put in clever places. Um, and it generally is fairly easy to understand in that, okay, fine, your application interacts with the cache. If the cache misses and gives you back null, well, go to the system of record. And then once I get that, put it back into the cache. Um, while it's simple, it's kind of, it has some problems in terms of how you're gonna be looking at things like race conditions between, well, okay, what if I have ask for the same key on a thousand threads concurrently within the application? Am I hammering my system of record? Am I potentially causing the write into the cache to actually get the, make the data go back in time? Other things like that. There's more of this race condition aspect that needs to be considered when using a system that works that way. Um, cache through is kind of the other way of looking at this, which is when the cache itself gets populated by something within the cache. So in this case, the application only talks to the cache directly, which either services the request or will actually go to the system of record itself to populate itself and then return the answer. Um, now these, because they require the cache to have a very intimate knowledge of the system of record, these usually involve you having to write some sort of plug-in or more in-depth um, configuration for whatever the cache it is. Um, so there's sort of where all those lie within how you'd be using this. So looking at JSR7, this sort of timeline displays, well, when that, how JSR7 has progressed, but also the interaction that has with EH cache and Terracotta. Because there's a lot of, a lot of people who have used Terracotta back in what's kind of the, the Terracotta 3 era, which was prior to its work with EH cache, where it was kind of its own thing. EH cache was its own thing back then too. A lot of people that I meet or see any, any information from talking about EH cache, they're usually referring to the kind of 2x EH cache world, which if they were doing it in the clustered world is on a Terracotta 4 server. Uh, nowadays for the past year or so, or about year, yeah, year-ish, um, we've been sort of working in the EH cache 3 space. So this is where EH cache has adopted support for JSR 107. So all the jabax.cache package, everything in there. Um, this is also the basis for EH cache clustered is the Terracotta 5 server. So the thing I work on. Um, there's also, just kind of to give more of a background on some of the JSR 107 and EH cache relevance, there's sort of a handful of various projects that have integrations that exist already. The slide's also out of date, so some of these things are probably further than this by now. You know, Spring, Juice, Jcast CDI, Hibernate, Jhipster, Deek. These things are all there for JSR 107. And some things that do have EH cache 3 specific interactions, uh, integrations, like Apache, Shiro, and Camel. Um, so looking at what we've been doing more recently in the EH cache world, sort of the 3.0 time frame. Uh, first of all, this, because there's a lot of people, myself included, didn't know what this meant when I first joined the team. But yeah, Easy Hibernate Cache was the actual origin of the name EH cache because it was originally built to be something on top of Hibernate. Now, of course, these days it's far more generic than that, uh, but the name is stuck. So EH cache 3.0, this was May 2016, so almost a year ago. Uh, this was a big, a big new release because this is where they went to being compatible with JSR 107. It's all the JavX cache. Uh, I'll actually be showing some of that stuff later as well. Um, this also had user managed caches, copier serializers, strong typing, which allows, of course, all the 
static analysis to actually mean something in your tools at compile time. So that's, that's sort of where everything begins with the 3.0 world. Uh, 3.1 was a smaller update to this, which introduced the clustered tier to the cache. So this in June last year is when it starts actually being able to run EH cache 3 on an actual cluster and um, get some of the benefits come along with that and different deployment opportunities come up with that. Uh, 3.2, so in November. Now this is where it kind of took the clustering aspect further uh, to introduce high availability clustering. So this is where, yeah, not only do you back end onto a server, but you actually back end onto several servers and they can actually make sure that even as they're going down for maintenance or you know, catching on fire or something like that, everything still works from the point of view of the application itself. The design overall for EH cache sort of comes down to kind of part of the high level is this tiering design. Um, first of all, it breaks down into a hierarchy. There's, the, there's always an authority tier within any use of EH cache. This is always gonna be the lowest level, kind of the, the slowest but largest. Uh, in fact, this basically needs to be the largest because it contains all the data in the cache. In all the other caches, in all the other tiers in the cache, the authority tier will always contain sort of the superset of all data that is present in any part of it. Um, you never get parts where there's orphaned data off in one of the higher levels of the cache. Um, caching tiers are then higher level parts that sit on top of that. Um, there can be sometimes more than one of these. So this makes sense as you get into larger deployments where you may want to have sort of different levels of caching that each give different performance advantages versus total actual resource cost. So in terms of what that looks like, um, if, you had, as if you had an example of a clustered EH cache use case, so you've got a couple applications here talking to one clustered server. In this case, the, if you look at the application caches, the orange ones are gonna be your caching tiers. So heap and off heap, or uh, yeah, heap and off heap tiers and their, their authority tier in this case is the clustered tier, which is the one that backends onto the server. So what these things mean then in terms of their overall comparisons, first of all, there's a few different kinds of tiers that actually are in each cache. The first one is the on heap one. Now this is fast access uh, because they're just Java objects sitting in the heap. Um, now part of the issue though is this is GC visible, so you've got a really big cache, which is all live objects, because the cache is keeping them there. Well, you're walking them all every GC, and that's kind of painful. Um, also, it means that if you want your cache to be larger, you have to make your Java heap larger, so you're losing potentially compressed refs, things like that. Um, off heap is sort of the next level up from this. Everything's still in system memory, so it's still pretty fast. Um, the difference is, this is, not in the Java heap, it's just allocated in the same address space somewhere else. So this means it's invisible to the GC. You can keep your heap small and have a really large um, off heap area if you want, and it's not gonna change any of the dynamics of what happens to the GC or within the managed heap itself in the Java heap. Uh, the problem is because this is now not part of the heap, they're not real objects. So they're bytes. So you're getting serialization, deserialization overhead to do this. Of course, kind of in the traditional model, the next thing you get is the disk. So yeah, this can be huge because disk is cheap, uh, but it's read and write to you know, SSD or in the worst case, some sort of spinning piece of metal. So you know, it's taking a while. Um, clustered is of course the, the interesting thing that's offered in EH Cache 3.1. This is where you're using a remote server. What's also interesting about this is it can be shared across multiple clients. So instead of having the, well, I need my load balancer to scale out to you know, 20 machines now to get this to work. Well, now I'm duplicating my data 20 times. Now it turns into the, well, wait, I can actually back end onto the same clustered storage, clustered cache. So as I scale out, I still get more or less my data being shared by that authority tier, even though the caching tiers on the individual clients can stay fast for the data they're using directly. And it also means you can do things like uh, the high availability with it. Um, now there's a few things here, special cases with this. Multi-tier configurations have some restrictions, mainly when it comes to things like, what about data which outlives your JVM? If I'm running with a cache on disk, well that disk data will survive even if I quit and restart the, the JVM. 
And also with the cluster, well, it's on a different machine, so it's going to survive too. So there's things like you can't use disk and cluster at the same time because they'd have a conflicting understanding of what was the real data because they can't be kept in sync while you're not running. So looking at the clustered caches aspect specifically and some of the things that you can do with that. Uh, so yeah, this came out in EHCache 3.1 and fundamentally it comes down to you're storing your data on the server. Now it's cache configuration is up to how that's configured as well. Might be on heap, might be off heap, whatever. There's different ways that that can be set up. Now, optionally, this also has high availability. Now, what this means is you have multiple servers storing replicated data. This isn't the same as, oh, I'm spanning out my data across several servers. It's the, no, all the servers actually agree on what your data is. The purpose of this is not, it's not something like RAID where you're trying to actually fan out across multiple resources. It's when you want just pure redundancy. Um, so yeah, like I said before, the data is shared by clients, so that gives you uh, some interesting behavior. But the consequence of that is consistency matters. So when you're just interacting with a cache, you can say that you know what consistency means. I wrote the data, I'm the only one writing the data, therefore the data is written. Well, if you've got a clustered cache, you now have several different clients, all trying to back end onto the same shared data store. So them actually being able to determine things like when I write a piece of data, when does everyone else agree that that's what I wrote? Um, and this comes down to being op an option because while it seems like an easy option to say, well, it has to be strong consistency. Before that write returns, everyone in the cluster needs to agree that that's the only answer that they could have. And yeah, for strong, that's what it'll do, which will cause extra overhead when you're trying to update a cache. But in a lot of cases, you don't care if it's precisely up to date all the time, just as long as it's eventually going to be up to date. So in that case, there's an eventual option, which basically comes down to, yeah, your writes will return faster because they only wait for the data to actually go to the server, not for all the clients to actually, all the other clients to agree that that's invalid. But they'll be notified and they'll eventually realize it's invalid. So what I wanted to do is sort of do a little bit of a demo here. I hope I'm reasonable for time. Um, that's, well, yeah, oh, that much. As long as I'm not racing through it. Um, Basically, I want to do a little bit of a demo here. This is something that's going to be using um, both EH cache. It's just a very simple loop through some data, stick it into a cache, pull it out, see what you can do. Um, it's going to be using, a, it uses both EH cache and the jcache XML, so the Javax JSR 107 stuff. Um, it uses a clustered cache with a high availability cluster. So I can so show what this sort of means in terms of um, interaction between these. So, that oh, looks weird. Uh, one of the first things I'm gonna do, so basically I'm gonna be running this with two servers as an example of the high, avail high availability aspects. So, I'll start one server and I'll start another server. So, basically with this, these things are up and ready to go. One's the active, one's a the passive. These are terms that exist within this. Um, and what I'll do is, first of all, these things are fairly tiny. Yeah, just update some data, loop through some things, and this one loop through some things. Not much going on. Um, just to give you that one idea of that, first, just run this, run through this quickly just to put a bunch of data into the cache. This is basically just meant to show being able to, to interact with what's there. Um, now, for example, in EH cache, so all this is doing is gonna run through the same data that was just put there, and it's just pulling it out of the cache. Now, this cache, however, is configured to only have a clustered tier. So there's no actual data local to this VM that's running. So if I wanted to do something like kill this, so now this is kind of showing some of the usefulness of it being the high availability cluster. So I just killed the main server that it was interacting with, it took five seconds for a new leader to be selected, and then everything carries on. And that thing can be restarted as well. Um, and uh, now let's kill the other one that took over. So now by this point, uh, again, it sort of waits a couple seconds to find the new leader and carries on moving. So in this case, this 
because I've had two servers as the um, two servers that I was interacting with on the, the back end, killed one, then the other. We're now actually running on a system which has, which none of the servers that are currently running actually saw this data ex come into existence. It's been replicated across them. They've, as they've sort of turned over and been killed and brought back up. Um, now, so we kill that and can run the same thing. This is on, on the same, back ending on the same data, just using instead the Javax cache, um, JSR 107 support. So not surprisingly, it works basically the same way. Um, similarly, as long as I find the right one there. So actually, I'm going to bounce this so it finds a new leader. Oh, I, whoops, I killed the one I had, had there. Let's see here. Probably, yeah, probably shouldn't have killed both of them at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I forgot to restart the other one. <laughs> you stop everything and just keep going. All right, so anyway. Um, yeah, no, this isn't set up with any restartable on server. Um, so this one is just the same example, but in this case using the, the Javax stuff. So, yeah. Of course, in this case, it turned around a little bit faster because I brought up the other one so it didn't have to wait to realize it was the only player. But essentially this comes down to, yeah, all this data that can work between both interfaces, having, uh, in this case, multiple clients. And it wasn't running them at the same time just to make the output actually sensible. But they can come and go into the cluster, interact with the same backend data store, and it can run in this high availability mode where uh, as your data is sort of, uh, you can bring servers down, bring servers up, and uh, they always will, they'll be able to resynchronize their state and continue maintaining the server, the, the clustered cache state uh, for a long time. Um, using the normal, the, the, the way it's set up in the open source version of it, there are other ways this can be set up in the enterprise level, but in the, the open source version, that's always how it works. It's pure redundancy in those cases. So everyone always has all the copies, um, you, which is also why in most cases you see these things set up with two servers. So you have one active and one passive that's ready to, uh, that's ready to take over at any time. Well, in both, in all these cases, they're referred to as the clustered cache because they always come down to, or clustered server because they always come down to, there's a bunch of these, there's a bunch of servers arranged in some setup. And then um, clients connecting to them and doing something to it. So this entire mass of machines. Um, there are some, basically everything we're doing right now is based, everything we're doing right now based on this um, is purely setting it up as redundancy so it's always, always what's referred to as one stripe of servers. It's, you make the decision at the cache level and then everything is either, it's either going to be strongly consistent, which is basically, it, it, it's essentially, a, that's a different way of cutting it. There's right now all the, the data will get replicated to all the servers. Um, basically there's more of an ordering guarantee in under Terracotta than some of the other systems. So they don't have to worry about, well, what if it only went to some of them? It's like, well, no, it goes to all of them in a certain order anyway. Um, so in this case, in either case, the data's actually gone to the server between strong and eventual. The only difference that you're getting between these two options is whether the other clients agree. So because other clients could have a local cache that has some other data in it, you know, you, you update a key and you've... Actually use just the clients, it's not necessarily the cluster of actual cache, the cache. Server. Yeah, the servers themselves are always consistent. Um, there's, there's a mechanism to make sure that whenever one of them fails over, upon the reconnect, um, everyone has a way of kind of re, re, 
kind of re-understanding their global order relative to each other. So everything's always consistent on the server. The only difference is, yeah, how aggressive, or do I need my write returning to mean something relative to other clients or not? Yeah, that's a um, situation that's often referred to as split brain, or basically of the cluster where you have both sides of it now decide they're the leader because of a break between them. Basically, what it's going to come down to is once the once they resolve the, kind of goes into more of the details of it, but once they resolve that network partition that caused the problem, one of them will become the leader, and one will become the real leader, the other one will have to resynchronize its state, and the clients associated with that are invalid. So, does that mean if I was using strong consistency in, in that situation that you wouldn't be able to write from either? It means that the clients, the servers would have a disagreeing view on who all the clients were. So, because since they will, they'll by that point each be trying to act like their own cluster. So I could say I want strong consistency, and in that situation I could have two different clients write different things, and it comes back to both of them saying, yes, I got it. Um, yeah, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't believe they were any longer part of the same thing. Essentially, by that point, they're no longer acting like one cluster. The problem comes about in those cases when it does become resolved, and you have an issue of, okay, a bunch of clients now can't connect to this. They have to reestablish a connection to the cache because the, the server now said, oh, I had to go down and I was wrong. I had to go away and come back up and resynchronize my state. And then when they reattach to the actual leader, it says, no, you can't reconnect to me. I don't know who you are. But they could have already acted on whatever they had because they did it right and it's claimed to be successful. Yeah, depending on, basically it's the, whatever is going on there, their, their, their sort of visibility into what's going on in the cluster, if it's partitioned at that level, is fairly limited. Okay, uh, so, sorry, another question. Yeah. Um, so what are you using for a leader election? Um, it's, I don't know if there's a generic term for it. Basically, it's sort of the, all the servers vote and their, their criteria for how they do that is you know, based on a bunch of fairly, a lot of it has to do with things like how far through the transaction stream are you, stuff like that. And determine a static, they can all statically agree upon the leader that way. But if there's a partition, each one can believe that they were the leader? Um, there's... Other criteria that you end up with in the election that are used in that situation. So um, sometimes you'll do it based on, I can't remember the, all, all the criteria right now, but it comes down to things like clients connected, uptime, a bunch of things like that. Basically trying to address what's a reasonable way of choosing a good leader versus what's just a way to come to a consensus. And, over, and as you sort of go down the, the ballot there, it, becomes, it, it decays that way. Um, yeah, all the, all the details of that stuff are on GitHub for the Terracotta OSS projects. So it is all there. Um, it kind of does get into the gory details of how I assemble a big election ballot. Is this, um, uh, part of the Jasper Ethernet that you were talking about, part of Java SE, like the JSR for, for Apache and stuff, the Java Cache? I don't actually know. I'm not. I'm not one of the people who's really paying close attention to that. I don't know which level it's considered part of. Although, given that I was able to, well, I'm. What I believe, what I'd assume, unless I was getting the dependency some other way, is that. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. Yeah. Short answer is I. I don't know, which profile it's part of. Is EHcache the, the reference implementation of it? Or? Um. I don't know who's. No. There. Um. I don't believe so, I can't remember what the reference implementation is. Because this one did come by slightly later. But was one of the earliest adopters of it. So, I don't know. Any other questions or comments or anything? Yeah, all right. Thank you.